All right, hi, I'm Bill Olson, and it's time for Free Speech Zone. And this is the first live show in over a month, or about a month, I guess. Uh, behind me, we have our brand new green screen studio. You can't really tell because it looks the same with my show, but maybe later on we'll uh, do a non chroma key look at this just for you guys. But in the meantime, we're going to start right out with a popular request. It's, uh, I got lots of requests for this one American Drone. It was the. Uh, first place winner of the uh, Paul Revere video contest that Alex Jones at Infowars.com uh, put out, I guess, two years ago, I guess, maybe about that much. Anyway, uh, American Drone is really uh, just what we need to play right now with all the controversy about Obama and his remote killing machines, the drones, and, and they're all justifying everything, saying the uh, collateral damage is worth it because these are the most precise weapons we have, blah, blah, blah. You know, nobody addresses the, the fact that we should not be using those weapons. When we use those weapons, it means we've failed at diplomacy. So anyway, let's go right into American Drone. We'll be back in 20 minutes. Shed. Yeah, spotted us. Man, is he booking it? Target's in the shed. Permission to prosecute. Negative. Circle the compound and stand by. Did we get a PID on the target? Uh, that's what we're working on. Stand by. Copy. Are you ready? Establishing track. Track established. Copy. Launching Hellfire. Three, two, one. Rifle. Impact in ten seconds. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, what's that? Was that a kid? I guess we just killed a kid. Ground Command, did you see this? Ground Command, did you see... Hi, Dad. 
Turn that down, son. Brendan, listen to your dad. What? Turn it down. Brendan! fall into the trap of thinking it's like a video game and I get it you know the keyboard the joystick but in actuality it's nothing like a video game there are real consequences for your actions real lives at stake your occupation seems awfully similar to what a video gamer might experience would you say people that always ask me that you know and it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that it's like a video game and, and I get it you know the screen the joystick the keyboard but in actuality it's nothing at all like a video game your actions have real consequences. There are real lives at stake. And that also means civilian lives, obviously, and not just your troops on the ground. Right. Of course. Have you personally been responsible for civilian casualties? Ma'am, that's not an approved question. Well, it's my job to keep the public informed. The only questions we will answer are the ones on the list. Agent, uh, if I may... The only civilian casualty that I'm responsible for was a goat. A goat? Yeah. You know what? A kid. A kid? Yeah, we killed a kid. A kid meaning goat. All right. It's time. Ma'am, you finish up your questions, please. Anything else you'd like to ask? Um, no, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, would I be able to get a photo of you? It was great talking to you, Staff Sergeant. Williams. Yes, sir. We see everything. Kelvin Williams. Oh, hey. What's this, uh... I just, I want to, uh, 
I want to I want to apologize for that awkward moment back there earlier. You mean that thing with the goat? Yeah, yeah, I shouldn't have. I just, I just haven't been getting a lot of sleep lately, so I... I Was it really a goat? You just sound like you want to talk. Listen, just, just don't print any of that, okay? Calvin, I can tell something's bugging you. You want to do the right thing, right? I'm trying to uncover a story about drones being used on U.S. soil. Can you tell That's me? just reconnaissance. Well, that's bad enough already, but I'm talking our mission. I need someone I, to I get... I can't be having this conversation right now, okay? But good luck. And I would feel a little more comfortable if we would get in writing a letter that says he doesn't believe killing people not actively engaged in combat with drones in America on American soil is constitutional. Sure would have short-circuited and saved quite a bit of time. I will say, though, that I'll believe a, more, a little more of the uh, sincerity of the president and of the attorney general if we were to get a public endorsement of the bill that says drones can't be used except for under imminent imminent threat. Hey. Hey. Wonder what poor bastard's gonna die today, right? Nobody. It's a training exercise. Training exercise? For what? I don't know. They didn't say. It's domestic. Ground Command, this is Jackboot 84. Do we have an eye in the sky? Negative, Jackboot 84. We're awaiting launch. He said, no, I'll go home today not having killed anyone. Yeah, it's just a job, dude. Nothing but a bunch of pixels on the screen. That's the way I look at it. But that kid the other day, that got to me. I didn't sleep for a week. Me too. I've been, I've been seeing goats everywhere. Goats. <laughs> Losing my damn mind. <laughs> I screwed up, man. Maybe you're not right for this. Maybe what we're doing ain't right. If you ever think about it, Pete, I mean, you, you can't hear these missiles coming. You can't hide from them. You can't. You got something to hide? Hey, Cal? I don't like what I'm hearing. You sound like those info wars nut jobs. What if they start using them here? Huh, Pete? No trial, no due process, just execution. Calvin? We're executioners. That's what we are. I hope you weren't transmitting. Okay, Jackwood 84, the eyes in the sky. This is a classified domestic training exercise. Orders straight from the top. Major input coordinates from the chat window and place the bird on autopilot while we brief you. Copy. Okay, the mission is to prosecute a high-value individual, a domestic terrorist living on American soil. We hacked the target's email and have evidence of his participation in a terrorist network. And on it goes, boys. Ugh, blah, 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 blah. We will circle around the target's place of residence, wait for him to travel by car to a remote location so we can prosecute the target safely. Do you copy? Uh, yes, ground command. Copy that. Copy.
Target in sight. That's it, guys. Follow the car. Copy. Copy. This is not an exercise. What? This is not an exercise. What is it now, Calvin? I know her. That's a report of the dinner view. Seriously? She said something about uncovering a story. They want us to take her out. Ninja's here, Dr. Kill. The paranoia is freaking me out. I am telling you, Pete, this is for real. Why would they lie to us? I don't know. All I know is that that's the report of the dinner view me. I told her about the kid, and now they want us to act like we're taking her out? It's weird, no? They'll probably just, probably just say it was a mistake or something. You're dangerous. Jack, we need for what's the hold up? Target is out of sight. Uh, ground command. Sorry, Airman Williams' flight suit got stuck on his seat. And I helped him get it unstuck. Roger that, Major. Continue following target. Copy. Following target. Uh, Ground Command, I noticed that the uh, target is female, not male. Copy that, Staff Sergeant. Good eye, but that's irrelevant for this training exercise. Proceed with the mission. Copy. We need to stop with this crap. You're going to get us both court-martialed. I'm telling you, Pete, something is not right. And you seem to forget that I'm your ranking officer, and I'm ordering you to cease with this crap. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Permission to speak freely. Denied. Come on, Pete. What are you going to do if we blow up this car today? Cal. On U.S. soil. A U.S. citizen. Training exercise or not. Don't tell me that doesn't sound a little crazy to you. It's legal, Kelvin. Don't you watch the news? The only thing you need to be worried about right now is following orders. Understand? One more peep out of you, you'll face insubordination. Are we clear? Crystal. Target is stopped under those trees. Yes, we see that, Major. The trees are no problem. Go ahead and prosecute the target. Copy. Master armed. Sensor, you ready? Sensor, Track are you ready? established. Copy. Launching Hellfire. Three, two, one. Rifle. Holding track, impacting seven. Sensor, did you see that? Yes, copy. Looked like a goat or something, impacting three. What just. Ground command, this is an armed predator? I repeat, we did not know this was an armed MQ1. Roger that, Major. This is a gross error. We're looking into that right now. What did I tell you? Oh my god, we just killed someone! Jack Wood 84 will investigate playback and figure out what happened here. Remember, you were following orders for a classified mission. Let's keep it that way. We'll handle the follow. I don't believe this is happening. Come on. Come Roger on. that, Major. We will advise you if any further briefing is required on this matter. Yes. yes! She made it. She made it. This is her. It'll be all over the news tomorrow. 
What? Yeah, Lionel, I'm sending you a video. Post it right away. We got him. Okay, man, that is such a great video. I love it. Uh, the terror and the the acting was superb too. By the way, I really liked that. Um, well, we've got a lot of corruption going on as usual, and uh, the latest corruption is the uh, Speaker of the House Hazard. Ha is that his name? Anyway, he uh, was set up. He was a he's one of the pedophiles who uh, they had the goods on, so they set him up to be their man, and they can jerk the rug just by bringing up the scandal, and that's what they did. And uh, then uh, the, the clip that we're going to have talks about that, but it also talks about a very important thing. The United States created ISIL. Okay, now let's, uh, this is Alex Jones, we're going to play this, it's about seven minutes long, and he has Wayne Madsen, a really good source of information. Go ahead. Wayne, uh, ISIS, I mean, this is so naked. How's it going for ISIS? How's it going for Saudi Arabia? Uh, and can they keep it hidden from the public that NATO's running the whole deal? Well, the group Judicial Watch managed to get a hold of this um, declassified uh, Defense Intelligence Agency message, uh, which basically from 2012, it states uh, that the Western powers, uh, the Gulf states and Turkey, uh, should all support these radical Syrian groups to bring down Assad. Uh, they talked about who they were, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which became ISIL or ISIS, um, the, um, the Muslim Brotherhood, and um, um, uh, the, the other, um, the other um, uh, Syrian uh, rebel group. Uh, they they call the Safalazist or the... Um, uh, Salafist, yes, yeah, thank you. It. The Salafis, and they're basically Wahhabists who tow the uh, Saudi uh, Wahhabist line. Uh, so here we have uh, a, a, a proof that the U.S. was uh, responsible for this. John Brennan is the real godfather of ISIL. Here's a guy uh, who um, was a former CIA station chief in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, is very much a pro-Saudi person, uh, and uh, and there are reports that he visit in Mecca, which you can only really do if you're a personal guest of the Saudi king or you're a convert to uh, Islam. And I think there was a former FBI agent who said, yes, uh, 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 Brennan did convert to Islam. And we know that he, remember, he... Stay there, let's break it down. This is so bombshell, folks. You understand, somebody's risking their life to give Judicial Watch. Judicial Watch is risking getting arrested. They arrest whistleblower groups now. I mean, I'd be scared to put it out if I got something like that. I, I would. Defense intelligence that our government put al-Qaeda in charge over there. I mean, that's big. That's proof. It was info wars and our operation that risked our credibility and our lives, I'll be quite frank with you, because I got some serious threats when we did it. It came out four years ago and then again two years ago, pushed the military to say no to openly arming and backing al-Qaeda to take down Syria. Wayne Madsen, of course, and many others at the tip of the spear exposing that. Now Bloomberg reported today, declassified, U.S. saw Islamic State coming, let it take Ramadi. What did we tell you weeks ago? They're arming them. The Iraqi government's caught them. They're led by foreign commandos. They've been trained by NATO, U.S., Israeli, and other troops. And folks, no, I'm not anti-Israel. I'm not anti-Turkey. I'm not anti-anybody. But man, any government that uh, that helps Al Qaeda murder Christians and these Salafists, same group, it's crazy. It's it's it just shows how evil our government is. Peaceful Christians by the hundreds of thousands are being displaced. Tens of thousands are being killed. Libya is a failed state. I want to get into that with Wayne Madsen in the last few minutes here with him. But first, Wayne, I saw on your website you got something pretty neat happening next Friday. In fact, if I had enough reporters, or if you can get somebody, you're going to be working with us soon. I, I'd have them walk with you live with a Skype feed and, uh, you know, uh, carry the feed on the nightly news, at least, or a recording of it 
or parts of it on the live show, you're doing something really exciting as a historian uh, and not just a former NSA guy and reporter uh, with a, a spy walking tour. Uh, tell us about that. Well, on uh, Friday, uh, the 5th of June at 930, gathering at the National Press Club uh, at the corner of uh, 14th and F Streets in, in downtown D.C., we're going to have a spy and scandal walking tour of the downtown area to mark the 10th anniversary of my website. I can't believe I've been doing this this long, but this, the Hastert story brought it all back. That was 2006, the second year of the website. So uh, we'll be hitting a lot of the uh, places that I've written about. And, uh, uh, and if there's time, we'll even go walk by uh, the law firm of Dickstein Shapiro, which is uh, Dennis Hastert's uh, law firm, which apparently he's uh, resigned from their government uh, practices uh, 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 branch uh, yesterday. So uh, there's many scandals within a few blocks of uh, uh, the National Press Club in the White House, which is two blocks away. So it should be a pretty good time. Yeah, see, and if we were a free country, th th this would be on Nightline. And we get top ratings, too. I mean, you know, telling the truth also gets ratings, but they won't let you do it because it would destroy their whole criminal system. But it's all coming to an end. What do you make of even Bloomberg reporting that basically the U.S. is working with al-Qaeda to take over Iraq? I mean, this is insane, and take over areas of Syria. No, it was clear. This this whole operation was to, it started with getting rid of Saddam and then Gaddafi in Libya and now uh, Assad in Syria, uh, at Yemen, uh, now a mess, a civil war. Uh, all those governments were secular uh, and now they're, uh, we run the risk of them being replaced by these Salafist uh, regimes, uh, where, as you say, they not only uh, kill uh, Shias, uh, other Sunni Muslims, Christians, and other minorities, but also uh, destroy antiquities, uh, uh, priceless, uh, irreplaceable uh, uh, World Heritage sites. Execute uh, women if they get caught not wearing gloves. I mean, give me a break, man. Our government's funding people that sexually mutilate women and make them wear gloves. I mean, I'm just, I'm done. I'm right. done with the scum that runs our government. And, and, you know, this defense intelligence leak, that shows people inside are really upset too, right, Wayne? Yes, because I looked at that at that message and un, unusually the header information, you know, the from, we don't know where it's from. That's been blocked out. Some of the some of the uh, uh, action and info at ease at the top of the message have been blacked out. Normally they don't black that out, but they let the bit remain about the um, uh, uh, U S and Israel and Western Europe, uh, Turkey and the Gulf States, Saudi Arabia and Qatar supporting these radicals uh, to overthrow us. Yeah, the military is just really upset. I think the globalists have gone too far. Wayne Madsen, thank you so much. God bless you. It's good to have you on the team. All right. Well, uh, I like Alex Jones sometimes. He's really <laughs> on the spot. So um, now we've got the Israeli-Palestine thing going on, and Israel has a massive machinery uh, going on here in the United States and around the world to actually control its uh, PR spin. And, uh, of course, we they have our politicians in their pocket. Um, and I, I still wonder, how is it possible that all those neocons in the Bush administration, and now some of them in the Obama administration, I guess, had dual citizenship with the United States and Israel? And I don't see how that can be. I thought that was illegal. But anyway, uh, so Israel's up to its latest tricks. You know, it's not enough that they're oppressing the Palestinians. It's not enough that they're keeping them in an open-air uh, prison colony and denying them medicine and food and electricity and you know common human needs the Israelis say we have to defend ourselves they threw a rock at us we had to blow the fuck out of them oh excuse me oh man I blew it up I, I, I gave the f-bomb there and they're gonna cancel my show because of that probably not but I won't do that again but it, it's such a serious thing uh, Expletive deleted, expletive deleted is about what you can say. But anyway, the Israelis set it up so that the Palestinians, the PLO, are being sued in an American court for one to three billion dollars. So this is the Real News Network and they have a report on that.
Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Also welcome to the Michael Ratner Report. The Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Liberation Organization have gone on trial in the U.S., accused of helping to carry out a series of terrorist attacks in Jerusalem and the surrounding area between 2002 and 2004. The PA and the PLO have denied their involvement and the responsibility and have argued that the U.S. has no jurisdiction over them. Now joining us to discuss all of this is Michael Ratner. Michael is the President Emeritus of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York. He's also the Chair of the Berlin-based International Center for Constitutional and Human Rights. He's also a board member of the Real News Network. Michael, as always, many of our viewers look forward to your report, so thank you for joining us. It's good to be with you, Sharmini, and good to be with the Real News. So, Michael, explain to us this case against the PLO and the PA in the United States. It's a really important case, unfortunately. And, of course, it's brought in what I consider to be the, the power behind the colonial power of Israel. And so its courts are quite favorable to Israel. Uh, imagine bringing a case for damages against the African National Congress in South Africa uh, during apartheid. Imagine bringing a case against the liberation movement of Algeria in Paris uh, during the War for Liberation of Algeria. Well, that's the equivalent of what you have in bringing a case against the Palestinian Authority, which is what this case is against, in the courts of the United States. Uh, and what the case is about is a series of, of uh, killings that took place 2002 to 2007, approximately seven of them, um, seven incidents in which 33 people were killed and scores were injured. And the Palestinians, Palestinian Authority, is being sued by the victims and the survivors of those killings. The case has been pending for a dozen years. It's been going up and down on various legal issues, some of which I'll mention. Um, but it finally is coming to trial. And we should do this with the understanding uh, that this is one of many cases in which Palestinians find themselves either sued um, or in which people go after them, or in which their efforts to get justice for, for example, the thousands killed in Gaza or the hundreds of thousands illegally moved uh, into, the, uh, into the occupied territories, their efforts to get justice against those causes come to complete failure in the courts. What you have is a worldwide justice system so far, at least particularly in the United States and in Israel, uh, that basically gives a blank check to what every, whatever Israel wants to do against the Palestinians and whatever um, Israel wants to do in the courts or its allies against the Palestinians. Back to this case. It's pending a couple of miles from my house in what's called the Southern District of New York. It's a federal court in New York. It was initiated by an NGO in Israel called Shurad Hadin, uh, which is a, essentially, in my view, opinion, a prep propaganda arm uh, for Zionism and particularly for Israel and brings these cases uh, all over the place without never without necessarily expectations of winning, although in this case we'll see what happened. Uh, the case claims that the Palestinian Authority, which is the Palestinian state, um, was behind the series of attacks in 2002 to 2007. Uh, they they sued for they are being sued the palestinian authority for a billion dollars uh, and they're being sued under a special law uh the 1991 anti-terrorism act that allows people who are citizens of the united states to sue for acts of international terrorism against u.s citizens outside the united states you could say that one of the primary reasons that law was passed was so that people uh, israelis and U.S. citizens living in Israel who were killed in the uh, ongoing wars in Israel uh, could somehow sue the Palestinians or the Palestinian state. And that's exactly what happened here. Um, prior to the trial starting, which has been going on now for a month, uh, the Palestinian Authority claimed that there was no jurisdiction in the U.S. court to try it. They said, how can you do this? It all happened overseas. The Palestinian Authority is in Ramallah. We don't have offices. Uh, of any sort in the United States. Um, there, to the extent we have a UN office, that doesn't count for jurisdiction. But of course, as you would expect in the US court, uh, the Palestinian Authority lost on that issue. The second and more important issue, 
again showing the bias and prejudice of our courts uh, that the Palestinian Authority raised, was immunity. Let me give you an example. If I go sue Haiti, if I go sue France um, in the United States, they immediately say we're a state and we're immune from lawsuits in the United States because states are immune under a law in the United States called the Immunities Act, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. On the other hand, look what happened here. The Palestinian Authority is sued, and of course, 134 countries out of 193 consider Palestine to be a state. It's been recognized by the UN to be a state. It signs international agreements as a state, including the International Criminal Court Agreement as a state. And yet, the United States courts refused to apply the immunity law, saying Palestine Authority of the Palestinian state cannot be sued. And so they went to court, the Palestinian Authority, saying, you can't sue us. Of course, what happened, the court said, we, uh, the, you aren't really a state under our, in the United States' eyes, and therefore, you're allowed to be sued in a U.S. court. Of course, the president could come in, the State Department, and say, we would like Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian state, given immunity, but the president hasn't done that. So the case is now at the trial stage. The plaintiffs in the case, who were the victims and survivors, uh, are claiming um, that the Palestinian state, the Palestinian Authority, um, is responsible for these killings. Responsible because it was the policy of the Palestinian Authority uh, to carry these out, or it was the standard operating procedure to carry them out. The defense is saying, we don't, with these acts, we don't, we don't think these acts are great. We don't like them. We condemn those, the acts of, of killing civilians. But it wasn't the Palestinian Authority or Palestinian state that did them. We're not defending them, but you can't hold the Palestinian Authority responsible. And how, is the, how are the plaintiffs going to sue their, going to prove their case? Well, uh, when there was an invasion, one of the Israeli invasions into the West Bank, they went into Ramallah, the capital of the West Bank capital of uh, Palestine, and they took hundreds of thousands of documents. And the plaintiffs claim those documents prove that the Palestinian Authority is behind these, these killings. In fact, when Human Rights Watch examined those documents, they said there was not proof in those documents that could say that the Palestinian Authority uh, was responsible uh, for what happened uh, to, the, to the victims uh, and, their, and their survivors. So I think the proof is going to be very, very thin. It's going to be a real stretch uh, for the plaintiffs to connect this case to the higher-ups in the Palestinian Authority. That's not saying what a jury will do in the United States. Um, this is a country in which the juries are very propagandized. The people are very propagandized by a good and the bad. The good is Israel. The bad is the Muslims, the Palestinians, etc. In any case, it's now in the U.S. court uh, on that issue. The judge has made some bad rulings. The first bad ruling is pretty remarkable. One of the claims of the plaintiffs is that the Palestinian Authority, through some entities, is giving money or has given money to the families of people who've been imprisoned for various, uh, be, having been convicted of various acts in Israel against, uh, against Israelis or, in this case, against U.S. citizens. And that giving of money to those families implicate somehow the Palestinian Authority in the acts of killing. Well, the first thing the lawyers for the defendant said for the Palestinian Authority is these people were convicted by the Israeli Defense Forces courts, by military courts in an occupied territory. How can you give validity to those convictions? The court, of course, the U.S. court said, we're giving validity to those convictions. Um, so that's the first thing. So you're, you're getting... They're getting that ruling so that giving of money to them can be taken into consideration by the jury and seeing is the Palestinian Authority responsible. Uh, the, the second fact, um, and it's important, is the, what I would say, it's not just the political, but the emotional appeal of this case to a jury. According to some people, not sure how accurate, but many of the jurors, some of the jurors were seen leaving the courtroom crying after the testimony of the survivors. One of the survivors said she was a child of six, six siblings. Her father was killed, et cetera, and then cried, et cetera. So, of course, it's very emotional. It's terrible. Um, but should it be tried in basically what I consider 
uh, colonial U.S. occupation court, at least the court that's behind uh, the colonial occupation court in Palestine. Um, I don't think so. Uh, so it's not going to be uh, a very fair jury, a very fair verdict in this case. Uh, the defense, obviously, that there was no policy by the PA, the Palestinian state, um, no standard operating procedure to do this. These were done by independent people outside of that, uh, and um, therefore the Palestinian state is not liable. Uh, I would still be surprised if the U.S. court doesn't find the Palestinian Authority guilty in this case, or at least liable for these damages. Um, let's hope they don't, because the evidence doesn't seem to be there. Um, we'll know within a couple of weeks. Let me just say, it's a case for a billion dollars, um, and it's tripled under this special anti-terrorism law. It could be three billion dollars. I don't think it's going to be easy to collect any money. Palestinian Authority has any assets here. Uh, but on the other hand, as people know, some parts of the Palestinian Authority are funded through various receipts from organizations in the world. And who knows what will happen if there's a judgment against them like this? Um, I don't know. Um, but let's hope there's not a verdict. I want to just say as I close this, let's put this in the context, not just the context of the occupation of the West Bank, occupation of the moving of people there of the three gaza wars in the last decade um, uh, but the context of what's happened in legal cases over the last decade against palestine and in favor of israel you had one this week on the real news you reported on the rachel corey case bulldozing a killing of a young woman who was trying to stop a house demolition uh, clearly a case that should have gone to trial palestine or the israeli supreme court says no uh, that essentially the laws of war don't apply to these cases. Uh, they're immune uh, from going to trial on those, essentially giving the Israeli Defense Forces a blank check to do whatever they want, which they've been doing pretty well right along. But here's the highest court in Israel uh, making that blank check um, even blanker. Um, what we should end on is this context. We've had three Gaza wars. We have an apartheid system in Israel. We have the transfer of a half a million people illegally under the Geneva Conventions to occupied territories. We have the Commission of Crimes Against Humanity against Palestinians. And then what we have in the face of that uh, is the refusal to find, uh, have a trial for the killing of Rachel Corey. And now we see this charade in the United States court of so-called uh, terrorism trial against the state of Palestine. Um, as I said, Imagine if this case were going on, an, AN, an African National Congress case, a Congress case, case against the African National Congress going on in South Africa during apartheid, a case against French, uh, a case in Paris against the Algerian liberation fighters in Paris during that war. Imagine the fairness of those systems. Uh, that's what you have in terms of this case going on in the United States. And in general, there's no justice for Palestinians within Israel, and there's no justice for Palestinians in the United States courts. Michael Ratner with the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Thank you for having me on The Real News. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Yeah, now wasn't it Canada that was trying to pass a law that any criticism of Israel will be considered anti-Semitic? Uh, no matter what, and banned. I mean, the world is absolutely insane. The idea that somebody could control the court and you still want respect for that court, that's, that's incredible. It's just like the UN. You know, what's with the idea of having eight permanent members on the Security Council that have veto power and nobody else in the world has veto power? What, what's with that? Just because we got the bomb? We got the bomb and that was good because we love peace and motherhood. Well, it seems to me that when, you know, Israel has been brought up on charges in front of the UN over and over again, hundreds of times, and it's always vetoed by the United States every single time. And, and in the rare instance, which I can't think of when an a resolution against Israel goes through, they just ignore it anyway because nobody's going to enforce it. it, it it's amazing. You know, the, the whole system is fixed 
and they want you to you know beat the drum well one of my favorite people is Glenn Greenwald and he's the one who uh, you know helped with the Snowden uh, documents and uh, he's one of the most elegant speakers he, he never says one word more than he has to and every word he says carries so much meaning I should be so elegant but anyway we're gonna play a little five-minute clip here where he's explaining why the US troops are every bit as bad as the ISIL troops you were on Bill Maher over the weekend and we were talking about these this ISIS group with others who are with them obviously and running to create a caliphate across the north of Iraq and Syria and you said something to the effect of who's worse really them or in essence the Americans who invaded or would invade you you equated our forces to terrorists yeah that's not actually what happened I mean the the point that I was making is that there's this phrase terrorism that actually has very little definition it doesn't mean really much of anything it's a fear-mongering word that the government invokes every time it wants to justify its policy from torturing people to putting people in Guantanamo well, without charges people are terror, no I mean, but okay yeah, I've, I've but, seen the video no, but so it, it, I mean they chop people's heads yeah off. and and I, uh, my point was that the United States and lots of other countries engages in some really severe violence as well. When we invaded Iraq, we called our invasion shock and awe. The purpose of it, Shep, was to do so much violence that we would terrorize the civilian population into submission, into surrendering. And we indiscriminately bombed Baghdad. We certainly didn't try and kill civilians, but huge numbers of civilians we were actually killed didn't indiscriminately by the Iraq do that. war. They picked pick targets very carefully from my, my memory of it. No, I mean, the, 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 the image that the United States government likes to depict well, of different. war is this very clear clinical focused bombing and yet civilians die every time the US military or other militaries are used because the military a machine designed to destroy and I'll, my, the point that I'm really making is that if we want to have policy discussions we shouldn't use fear-mongering terms and just have the government scream terrorism every single time it wants to justify something of course ISIS are horrible people doing horrible things no civilized rational person would dispute that but I think there's a lot more complexity to the question than simply to say they're terrorists that means we now have to go and fight them I watched the Mar thing and I, I saw a member of the American military really quite upset with you because he I don't know, it, it felt rightfully so at the time that, that you were equating them to terrorists, these, these men and women who, who really do enlist most of the ones I know to go fight for our freedom yeah, and to no, be good Americans. I don't think any, look, anybody can question and even vehemently criticize decisions by our political leaders to send people to war and nobody should hold the soldiers who are sent there responsible for that decision. And so the question of is an invasion that's aggressive in nature and based on false pretenses of a sovereign country like Iraq terrorism, that has nothing to do with blaming the soldiers who are sent to that country by political leaders who they can't question but have to obey. I think everybody has learned in the United States to distinguish between political leaders and the soldiers when it comes to questioning and, and even condemning war decisions. The, the process of getting this information to the public has been, I don't know, a messy one if controlled on some level. If you look back, w what would you do differently? I mean, I think that it, the, the, the task journalistically was extraordinarily difficult because you have so many pressures when you're handed many tens of thousands of top secret documents from the most powerful government in the world. You have on the one hand an obligation to be responsible in what you're publishing, not to put lives at danger, and on the other hand you have a responsibility to the public to make sure they're seeing the things that should never have been hidden in the first place. And then on top of that you have the responsibility of accuracy, the supreme journalistic obligation to make sure that what you're reporting is, is accurate and true. And so, sure, I could go back like any journalist I'm sure you could look at broadcasts you did a year ago and say I wish I had done this a little bit sure differently can. and this a little but bit I just differently. wondered if specifically you could think of something that man I should have done that you know, no, I mean, on the whole, I think the debate that has been triggered around the world and that is sustained a year later, not just in the United States, but globally, about surveillance and privacy and the dangers of having governments use power in the dark has been a really healthy one. And on the whole, I'm, I'm really gratified by what we were able to achieve. Do you spend any time worrying that people might have died in this? No, and, and the reason is, is because, I mean, no. you know, it's like saying, do you worry that your last broadcast caused the death of people? If I said to you, maybe your last broadcast caused the, caused the death of people, you very rightly would say to me, well, how did that happen? Which, what it is, that, is it that I said that caused people to die and which specific people died? There's never evidence presented by anybody that But any as you've heard before in these interviews, because I've seen most of them, we don't know when CIA people die. Chef, I, I, can I, I know I can very well who, who did things that he couldn't talk about for America and he said when I'm gone you'll hear about
about a car wreck in Arizona, but that's not what happened. I, you know, I've heard people say all the time that Fox News puts men and women in, 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 in war in Careful. danger by criticizing President Obama. Well, and before on. I believe what, that, I would say... Did MSNBC do that? Yeah, I, well, that, that's my point. I would want to hear evidence before I believed any of those kinds of accusations about other journalists. And so if people have evidence that we did that, I can guarantee you if, if any of the stories that we published from these Snowden documents caused the death of anyone, people in the Obama administration would be running to the New York Times in order anonymously to plant that to discredit the journalism that we're doing. The fact that they haven't, that they can't point to any of these harms, means that no rational person should be willing to entertain those kinds of inflammatory accusations. Right on. Yeah, isn't he great? I just love the way he, he, he said, uh-uh, and he tells you exactly why. It's, well, as many of you know, uh, day after tomorrow, the Patriot Act, or at least sections of it, will expire. And Rand Paul is one person who is running a uh, filibuster and blocking the uh, consideration of, of, you know, an extension. I, I certainly hope it works. Uh, we need to completely cancel the Patriot Act, but, you know, they're saying that it doesn't really matter because we have so many other, you know, laws now that cover it anyway so that they can still do anything they want, even if we got rid of that. Well, let's get rid of it. But now they're talking fear-mongering. They're trying to make it look like you're bringing terror to the United States if you don't vote for that act. Well, let's go ahead and play this clip, and that'll probably take us out. Greenwald, he lambasted the New York Times, accusing them of being a mouthpiece for the Obama administration for their article on the Patriot Act expiration, which anonymously quotes several high administration officials who state things like allowing the Patriot Act to sunset would be playing Russian roulette with national security. Greenwald went on to say that the Times was essentially playing the role of fearmonger and using Dick Cheney-like language and rhetoric in order to keep the Patriot Act alive. So joining me now to weed through the mudslinging is media critic, attorney, and Emmy Award-winning news decoder, our friend Lionel in New York. Lionel, great to see you. Great to see you as well. Now first, uh, what do you think? Tell us what this is really about. It's about nothing. That's the good news. <laughs> this is about the sunsetting, perhaps, of Section 215 of the, of the Patriot Act. No one will read this. No one will refer to it. But the way the media are portraying this is that this is, in essence, the end of the Patriot Act. So what's going to happen is, in my opinion, the Obama administration and the world of intel couldn't care less whether Section 215 lapses, whether it sunsets, whether it expires, whether it's replaced. In fact, they secretly hope it will sunset so that privacy fans, of which most of us are, will claim victory and go home and think we've won. It will cool down their ire. It will redirect their, their interest elsewhere when in fact it's a diversion. Right now, whether 215, this section is removed, it doesn't matter. There's a section 720. There are still FISA courts. There are PDDs and signing statements and executive orders. Did you know that as far as FISA courts, in its 33 plus years of existence, out of 34,000 applications, 11 or maybe 12 now have been rejected. So the idea that our government, that the United States or, or Intel or anybody is somehow thwarted, prevented, from going and investigating terrorism or, or quasi-terrorists or whatever you want is a fraud. So whether it, it lapses, whether the Patriot Act is replaced with the USA Freedom Act, and remember, the better the sound of the act, the more treacherous it is. <laughs> Patriot Act, Freedom Act, it doesn't matter because whatever the government wants to do, it will do. So I, I just want to summarize here. You're saying basically that Section 215, whatever happens to it, it's, it's basically irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant because right now there are other aspects, there are other ways, other means by which the government can use its, its, its protocols already in existence. And here's the best part. America today, I'm sorry to say this, whenever they, if ever they smell that perhaps maybe the government's been overreaching, all you have to do is say 9-11. It's like a dog whistle. 9-11. <laughs> that's it. 
and you can say do you want because remember years ago the smoking gun could be a mushroom cloud that theme that meme has never left us and those powerful images are all you have to say so remember with our new attorney general worried about FIFA and now worried about this not Wall Street no 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 not 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 those crimes but as long as this discussion continues and as long as American voters in particular remain as nescient and as incurious as to what's really going on nothing will change now, would you, would you say that the media is perhaps uh, uh, exploiting the country's Pavlovian response to 9-11? To That's kind of what it sounds like to me. Pavlovian obeisance, the patellar reflex. You know, the New York Times basically says, let it expire. Look, the media, notice we don't call it the press anymore, but they're the media. They're repeaters. They're not reporters. They're not going to go through this and say, wait a minute. Do we really need Section 250? What is the Patriot Act? Have we ever had, in fact, if you look at the president and the government's own reports, there's not been one act of terrorism thwarted by these draconian and, dare I say, tyrannical uh, legislative uh, implementations. Nobody, they never question that. They repeat because it's off to the next story. Sure. Of a duck playing the piano or a viral video or no. a cronut or something. <laughs> a cronut. Now, the, I never thought I'd hear cronut weaved into a conversation <laughs> about the Patriot Act, but uh, The Intercept, Glenn Greenwald also says that the Obama administration's approach is Cheney-esque. Uh, do you go along with that language? I, I differ a little bit because Dick Cheney was more ham-fisted. Dick Cheney and Addington and his cronies developed this idea called the unitary executive where the the administration the executive was preeminent and he said we're going to do this because we can do it the Obama administration is a little bit more deft a little bit more polite in its tyranny they're, they're a little bit more yes yes <laughs> they're more user friendly Dick Cheney loved to say basically I'm gonna do it you know I, I I don't really care what you say but nothing has changed. Remember